Good morning or good afternoon everyone. I hope you enjoyed a great Christmas break with your family in your household together. This year was so different, wasn't it, uh, than most. Uh, the digital presence of our family was challenging. One of our daughters and her husband lives in Arizona and uh, it was really unique not having them in the room but just having them on FaceTime draped over a chair with my iPad and having Christmas, opening presents with our family around the Christmas tree digitally was quite a, a unique experience. So I hope that your unique experience was the same, but you didn't lose the meaning and the warmth of Christmas. I want to commend you all for persevering 
with the current restrictions of COVID-19. Uh, we know they're not forever, but it has made December uh, and the Christmas season so challenging at times. So thanks for praying, thanks for persevering, and uh, getting through this time together. I want to encourage you with a verse today. James chapter 1 says, Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters. When you meet trials of various kinds, I want you to know if you looked at that original word trials, there are two kinds of trials that um, James actually points to. There are light and momentary trials, and then there are severe trials. And what we're going through right now with COVID-19 is a light and momentary trial. We know that this is difficult and we don't want to minimize that, but certainly our lives are not at uh, uh, a peril of being uh, lost uh, if you are practicing safety and health in your home. So many trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Romans, Paul writes to the Roman church and he says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that our suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through his Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So we know God's Holy Spirit has been given to us for such a season like this. Empowerment for witness is one of the reasons we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, but also endurance, courage to uh, overcome some of these sufferings or trials as Paul and James have pointed out to us. So I want to give you a quick reminder today that um, we are approaching the end of the year. If you'd like to be uh, receded for your year-end donations, I just want to give you a quick reminder. In order to be receded for any charitable donations within the year 2020, uh, we would like to receive those by December 30th. Our office is going to be open on that day from 1 to 4 p.m. in case you'd like to stop by and uh, drop off your donations. Please remember that you can give online at any time through APA's website, Prior to December 31st, the year end, you can use text to give or the give button on the website itself. As you know, we've tentatively set a date for our AGM. Uh, we've been announcing it week over week, uh, January 24th, but please be flexible with us because we're trying to work within the restrictions. So uh, the online and on-site uh, delivery of that AGM may be adjusted depending on where we are in this global pandemic hoping that the restrictions for public gatherings will be lifted and uh, we might be able to get back to some sense of social gathering or public gathering early in the new year. We are so grateful that uh, the uh, medical health authorities are working kindly with us. I've been on calls with uh, Bonnie Henry and others and we're trying to make sure she and her team understand the special circumstances around church gatherings and how important and essential religious gatherings really are. Please remember in preparation for our AGM, your submission for potential uh, board member candidates can be received, but they must be postmarked by January 3rd. So that's just next week and we'd like to receive those. You can email them into our office or use postmail, but we'd like to receive them prior to January 3rd so that we can process them uh, in time for the AGM on the 23rd of January. Please remember just quickly that all those nominations are to be submitted in confidence because the nominating committee has to process those um, nominations biblically, constitutionally and ecclesiastically using criteria that's been predetermined. I'd like to uh, invite you to discover more about becoming a member of APA and you can do so by going online. There is a uh, form that's online that will trigger a membership process or you can call the church office and um, Pastor Al or Verna would be delighted to hear from you and lead you through that process more personally. This morning we're going to hear a message, a timely message from Pastor Al Funk. As you know, Pastor Al and Verna have been appointed by our board as interim pastors of care and ministry coordination. They're doing an outstanding job at the church, making sure that the wheels of our church are still moving ahead. And uh, we just want to lend our ear to Pastor Al's message today. 
And at the end of his message, I want you just to be prepared that he's going to lead us in communion, Holy Communion, the sacred elements of what Christ gave to his disciples on that night that he was betrayed. We're going to exchange those at the end of this message. So if you have a moment, just prepare a little bit of juice and a, a cracker or something like that so that you can join in with the communion service at the very end. Let's give uh, Pastor Al our attention this morning. Hello, my name is Al Funk and together with my wife Verna, we are serving here at APA during this transition period as the pastors of care. And we look forward to meeting you. And if you have a chance to drop by the office someday, uh, make sure you stop in and, and say hello and uh, let us get to know you. As we come to the end of this year, 2020, it's kind of like, what do you still need to say in this year? Sermons have been preached, blogs have been written, social media posts have been, have been put up. And, and it's almost like we're just waiting for this year to get over with so that we can get into 2021 and hopefully it's going to be better than it's been. But I think there's one thing that, that I think I want to bring to you this morning and it's, it's a word for you and for us maybe as we go into this next year that we as a church can, can kind of focus on, can, can maybe make our own as we enter 2021. It's the word unity. Unity is, is an interesting word. It's, it's something we maybe don't say a lot. Uh, it's maybe not a, a word that enters our conversation every day. We have a lot that we say now about independence. We say a lot about personal rights. We say a lot about how it's, it's an individual thing. But the reality is that unity is one of the greatest marks of the New Testament church. Unity is one of the things that God calls us to in Scripture. And so I want to read a Scripture to start. And then we will go from there and talk about what it means to be in unity. The scripture is found in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. Uh, Jesus is, is praying for his disciples, and this is his prayer for them. Let me read it. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. This is what Jesus is praying for them. This is his high priestly prayer. This is kind of one of the last words that Jesus has. And last words are important words. And some of his last words to the church was that the church would live and function in a place of unity. Let's talk about what unity is. What, what is it? We often think, of, when we think of unity, we often think of sameness. It's like, you know, somebody gets rubber stamped. We all come in looking different. But if we're here long enough and we spend enough time together and we do the same things together long enough, then eventually we will all be the same. But that's not unity. That's uniformity. That's where we get the word uniform. Everybody looks exactly the same. The truth is that there's a big difference between sameness and unity. There's a big difference between us all being identical and living in a place of unity. And I want to give you a definition for unity that I think really fits what the New Testament is talking about when it talks about unity. Let me give it to you. Unity is where different people with different personalities and different gifts and different passions and different strengths all work together to accomplish a common purpose. When all of us are different, and, and, and we are, they say that no two people are exactly the same. No two snowflakes are exactly the same. Uh, when all of us are, are our unique individual personalities with our own unique individual gifts, when we bring all of that together to serve a common purpose, it is amazing what we can accomplish in, a th in, in those times. 
When we look at the scripture in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to 14, where it talks about the spiritual gifts, it is not the fact that they all have the same gift that makes the church strong. It's the fact that they all have different gifts and that those gifts work together to accomplish amazing things in different situations. You know, if we want an example, just our worship team this morning, you know, we have Canyon and we have uh, Robin and other people that, that have, have joined together. They play different instruments. They, they play different notes or sing different notes because some are singing harmony, some are singing the melody, some are singing different parts. But all of those instruments together make up this amazing sound. And the technical people and, and all of the people that work behind the scenes if it wasn't for everyone being different, the sound that you would hear today would be rather kind of monotonous and boring. But it's because of the differences that it comes through as strength. When we look at our physical bodies, one of the beauties of our physical bodies is that the parts are different. I only have one left hand because I only need one left hand. It's the parts of the body working together. When the parts of the body don't work together properly, the physical body, when they don't work together properly, then we get something that we call a disability. But when the parts of the body all work together, there's this amazing unity that happens and the body can accomplish incredible things. So if you enjoyed the diversity of, uh, of our worship team this morning, why don't you just clap for them there in your living room? I'm sure that wherever they are, they'll be able to hear you and just let them know that they are appreciated for all of the different gifts and all of the different things that they bring in order to help us worship this morning. When unity is missing in the church, the effectiveness of the church is, is stymied. It, is, it becomes a disability, actually. It becomes a church that is disabled and not able to do the call of God that he has placed on us. So that's kind of what unity is. It's not sameness, but it's all of us using our different gifts and abilities to accomplish a common purpose. Let's talk a bit about how unity is created. Uh, so, so we know what we want. How do we get it? How do we, how do we get to that place of unity? Let me share with you just three, three things this morning. First of all, unity begins with what we have in common. Unity begins with what we have in common. I come from a large family. But what we have in common in that family is the same parents. That brings a level of unity to our family. That, that causes us there to be this oneness in our family. Unity in a church starts with the fact that we are all part of the same body of Christ. We have all responded to the same gospel. We have all invited Jesus Christ to come into our lives. And because of that, we have something incredible in common with what we believe about Jesus and, and why he came and why he died and, and what he has in store for us in our future, that's the basis of unity for us. We have just come through the Christmas season and behind me you still see some of the, the decorations from that. But, but this is the, the place where unity starts with Christ coming into the world and then Christ living among us and dying on a cross and returning to heaven. And because we have responded to that, that brings us into a place of unity. In a little while, at the conclusion of this service, we're going to be doing communion, and we are celebrating the death and, and resurrection of Christ. We are celebrating his broken body and his shed blood. That's one of the things or one of the ways that we express that unity as we take that together, the bread and the cup, as we take that together, it reminds us of the unity that we have. We all come to the foot of the cross. We all start at the manger, but we all have to end at the cross because that's the place where unity is created originally with us but we also have in common a vision of reaching other people of seeing people's lives transformed by the power of God not only is this for ourselves but but we have this shared vision that that we want to see others come to know Christ we want to see other people be included in the body of Christ 
It's not just for us. It's for everyone. It's why we do what we do. It's why we give our money. It's why we invest our time. We want to see people come to know him and to be changed by his power. And that is also part of what brings us in. We have a common purpose, seeing people come to know Christ and, and come to encounter him in a powerful way. So the first thing is unity begins with what we have in common. But unity also grows as we practice Christian graces toward each other. Social media is a great way for us to, to stay connected with family and friends. And uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful platform for those reasons. But one of the things that can happen is that we sometimes say to others what we, uh, on social media, because we're hidden, we say to others things we would never think of saying to their face. And it's possible that, that sometimes we lose our ability to be nice because we think we are anonymous. When I talk about practicing Christian graces towards each other, it's really about being nice. To each other. Paul says it this way in Colossians 3, 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. The, the image here is of getting dressed. When you get dressed in the morning, you put on your, your socks and your pants and your shirt and all of those things. Well, when we encounter other people, it says that we are to put on compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness. And it's not just put on as in pretend. Now, there are days where you might have to pretend to be nice or kind or gentle. But, but the idea is that these become the character traits and qualities of our lives forgiving one another. It's not a question of, do I forgive this person? But it's really a question of, I have committed myself to forgiving. And so it may be a little difficult to work it out in some circumstances, but it's still one of the things we are to clothe ourselves with as believers. And that's part of the, the, the Christian graces. It's in all of these things. It's what we do for each other. If you will notice those words in that scripture, if you read them, none of those things are about us. It's not that we do this for us, but it says that these are the things we are to do for each other, for the other person, that, that in order for us to maintain unity, this is how we live towards others. We are called to live unselfishly. We are called to be servant-hearted. Insisting on our own way is the best way to destroy unity. But when we are willing to give toward the other, that's the way of creating unity. When we show those Christian graces to one another, it's the way that we develop unity and are strengthened by it. The third thing that we do in order to create unity is ultimately we need to understand that it is a work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus prayed for unity in this prayer. He, he prays for unity. He doesn't just say, well, this is automatic. You, you became a Christian. You attend a church. So therefore now everybody is automatically in a place of unity. No, he prays for his disciples. These are the same disciples who on the road walking from one to play other, they were bickering about who was the greatest and who was this and who was that. And, and, and Jesus comes to them and says, really like, like, hey guys, we don't do that kind of stuff. As Christians, we are called to something higher than that. And he says, we are to pray for unity to take place in the body of Christ. One of the things the enemy does to destroy the work of God is, is to destroy unity, is to create division. 
The Bible says that that's what he does. But we as believers are called to unite ourselves around Christ, around the mission of Christ. We are called to unite ourselves around the purposes of God. And when we do that, it enhances the unity that the Holy Spirit brings into our lives and into our midst. The Holy Spirit is all about creating unity. And so we need to submit ourselves to him. We need to give ourselves to him so that he can work out unity among us. So we talked a little bit about our responsibility to maintain unity, but let me take it another step further. Unity is our responsibility to maintain. In Ephesians 4, verse 3, it says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of, pre of peace. Is it okay if I get a little practical here for a couple minutes? Over the next few months, we as a church are going to be selecting a new pastor. It's a big job. It's a big job. And, and we need to be, be praying about this. We need to pray for the search committee who will be starting their work in January. We need to already be praying for that person who will become our new lead pastor. Praying that God starts to work in their heart. Maybe God has to release them from where they are. Or maybe God has to make them willing. We need to pray for that person. This new pastor will lead the church into the next stage of life that God has for this church. And I want to let you in on a little secret, okay? It's just between us. Not all of us are going to get the kind of pastor we want. Not all of us are going to get the kind of pastor we want. Some may want a more charismatic one. Some may want a, a conservative one. Some may want a young one. Some an older one. Some, some a middle-aged one. Some want a great preacher. Others a great leader. Others a more pastoral type. And the list goes on and on and on. And no one person has all of those characteristics or qualities. No one person can fill all of our expectations. No one person can be the one who meets all of those things. The challenge will be, can we live in unity even if we individually don't get exactly the kind of pastor we want? Can we still say, hey, I'm part of this body. I'm going to throw myself in. I'm going to be part of what's going on here instead of sitting in the back row and sniping and griping because we didn't get quite what we want or say, I'm out of here. I'm on to a different church. Pastor Al, you're being kind of tough on us. Yeah, it's better to be tough now and we can, we can be gentle later. But, but, but I just want to sort of say this, that... that that we need to say we are willing to be in unity when that decision is made by the body and we move forward. We need to move forward in unity. There's a little interesting piece on the end of that verse. And it says that we do it through the bond of peace. I believe that what those words mean is that we are committed to living at peace and in unity with each other even when we don't get our own way. You know, it's like saying, God, your will be done. And then when we don't get what we want, we go, well, that's not the pastor I wanted. I'm out of here. You know, can we commit ourselves, God, you obviously know this is the person we need and we are going to work together. We are going to be part of, of seeing God do amazing things in and through this place in unity. I know it's hard at times, but at times we may have to bite our tongue till it almost bleeds in order to maintain unity. At times we're going to have to just keep our mouth shut. Pastor Al, you're starting to meddle. I'll move on, okay? But I just wanted to say that. I want to encourage you towards saying, I am going to be part of the future. I am going to be part of what God's going to do. I am going to be part of this. And, and, and wh whoever God brings through the process he uses, I am committed to living in unity with this body. John 17, 23 says, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Can I tell you something? 
It's not our programs or our spiritual gifts or our great worship that speaks to the world around us. Most of the time they ignore those things, to be honest. Those things are more for us inside the church. But what speaks to the world the most about who we are as a church is when we can live and work together and walk in unity with one another. Last thing, unity is the place of God's blessing. Unity is the place of blessing. It's amazing what can be accomplished when a group of people work together for a common purpose. It's even more amazing what God can do with that group of people. Psalm 133 is a verse that many of you know, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. The birth of the church came out of a place of unity in Acts 2, 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Another translation says, in one accord. That day, about 3,000 people were added to the church. We'd say that's a pretty good Sunday, wouldn't we? We can keep going on, but let me wrap this up. Just from what I see here, unity is more important than worship style. It's more important than gifting. It's more important than preaching. All of those things are good and they are important. But without unity, we miss out on God's blessing for us in the body of Christ. Jesus prayed this prayer for his followers shortly before he left them. And it can be a prayer for Abbotsford Pentecostal Assembly as we go into 2021. Can we make this our prayer as well? God, that you would help us to live in a place of unity, to worship in a place of unity. May we be one. May unity mark this church. May we be brought to a place of complete unity. Not sameness, but unity. Remember our definition from earlier. Unity is when people with different personalities and gifts and passions and strengths work together to accomplish a common purpose. And let me encourage you that with this. When that happens, anything is possible. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that in Jesus Christ we find our greatest place of unity. That in him we find the greatest uh, ability to come together. There are so many things that divide us, so many things that pull us apart. But God, I pray that our focus would be on Jesus Christ, on on his birth, on his death, on his resurrection. That our focus would be on seeing other people come to know him as well. That we would put aside our our differences or our, our preferences. And God, we would focus on those things that we have in common and those things that bring unity to our body. We pray that 2021 would be an amazing year for APA as we move forward into it with anticipation and excitement, and we look forward, God, to what you are going to do among us, because you will do great things as we work in unity. God, God, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. As we move into communion, um, I want us to take a look at 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I hope you've had time to to find something you can use for bread and also something you can use for the cup and that you're ready to share this with us now. This is ultimately what brings us together. This is ultimately the greatest thing, and we mentioned it just a few minutes ago, that that it's the gospel. It's finding ourselves at the feet of Jesus. It It is inviting Jesus to come into our lives, which brings us into the family of God and which unites us and causes us
to be one. It is through the shed blood and the broken body of Christ that we are brought into unity in the family of God. It's not because we're all particularly good looking. It's not because we're all particularly talented. It's not because we're all particularly wealthy or any of those things. It all comes back to Jesus Christ and his birth and death and resurrection on our behalf. And so today we want to take the bread and the bread represents the body of Christ. It represents the fact that his body was broken. He took the punishment for our sin on himself. He allowed himself to be punished so that we could be set free and forgiven. The juice reminds us of the blood of Christ, which was shed. And, and really that represents his life that was poured out or his life that was given for us in order that we might have life and that we might be given life. And so we're going to do this. Uh, as I break the bread today, you can, wherever you are, take your bread. And I want us to take this bread together, reminding ourselves of what Jesus Christ did on our behalf Eat the bread together. And now I invite you to take the cup and to drink it, remembering that the blood of Christ was spilled in order that we could, through his death, receive life, in order that we could be forgiven in order that we could be set free. I invite you to drink the cup together. And Paul wrote, therefore, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's not just that we're saying it happened, but what we're saying is we are proclaiming that this is something that we have personally partaken of in our lives. Just like we eat the bread, take it in, just like we drink the cup, take it in. So we have taken in the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. Let's pray today as we conclude our service. Father, we are so thankful that you sent Jesus into the world. We are so thankful that Jesus was willing to go to, to not only be born in humble circumstances, but also willing to go to the cross on our behalf. And as we have eaten this bread and drunk this cup, we are reminded once again and we once again declare that, that the body of Christ was broken for us, the blood of Christ was shed for us, and that we receive that today and we welcome his death on our behalf. And Father, as we go from this place of worship today, even though we are scattered throughout the city and beyond, God, we just pray that our lives would represent you well that the world around us would see that, that we have been brought together by Christ. And now we are living out the life of Christ in our communities, that they may see Jesus through us. Father, we pray your blessing on, on Abbotsford Pentecostal Assembly as we move forward. We look forward with anticipation to what you will do. And we commit ourselves to you and to walking in unity in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God be with you. Just stay tuned for a few announcements, but uh, we look forward to meeting with you again in the new year. Happy New Year, everyone. God bless. Thanks, Pastor Al, for sharing that message with us today. Uh, an amazing reminder to us of persevering and putting our faith and trust in Christ. It's also so important for us to have shared in the sacrificial death, the burial, resurrection of our Savior. I know that sometimes we just go through communion uh, without really giving our full time attention and respect and honor to the sacrifice that Christ made for us individually, saving us and giving us eternal life. I want to encourage you to apply Pastor Al's message that was shared with us. Apply it to your life today and uh, prepare now for a great new year ahead. I know the date on the calendar will change in a few days and uh, it'll become 2021, but we also understand that the difficulties of 2020 have not yet been overcome. 
So as the calendar changes, maybe what changes with it is our attitude and our attitude toward having hope in a new future where Christ is working things out. Let me also thank you and commend you for your generosity. If you'd like to invest in the shared mission, please check out our online options. And just a quick reminder that you can give through text to give or the give button on our website. Or you can simply drop by the church office on December 30th. We're opening the office from 1 to 4 just so that we can receive any year-end donations so you can be receipted in the calendar year of 2020. Thanks for being generous to our church. Thank you.